If you enjoy the video, please give it a like. And if you enjoyed the channel, go ahead and give it a subscribe. All right, now on to the episode. And we are back. What is up, dummies? You on from Manga for Dummies is here to continue our rundown of My Hero Academia Vigilantes. Now, after having done some personal reviews on the last episode, I have since gotten myself a pop filter, which I hope would make things better, but just go ahead and tell me if there's an improvement or not. Now, we already did volume one, which I'll try and link somewhere around here and create a playlist so you can sort of just go through everything we have so far, one after another. Anyway, um, wow, volume one was a rough go. We met our main cast of Koichi, uh, the Crawler, Knuckle Duster, and Popstep, and got a good idea of their powers, or lack thereof. We found the overall plot of finding the source of the trigger drug, and we've left Volume 1 off with Knuckle Duster picking up that Quinn's bees probably have some major role to play with the whole trigger situation. By the way, let's jump right back in by starting Volume 2. Now, in the first volume, we were introduced to the police detective Naomasa, but as he didn't really play too big of a role, I decided to omit him from there. But essentially, he's the representative of the police force. Now, I do think it is important to mention that alongside the licensed superheroes of this world, there are also the police in this universe. I imagine that these guys handle the more mundane tasks, like giving out traffic tickets, and I'm guessing most investigative work. Their roles should be reserved for taking out other superpowered beings or during big problems for the most part. A police officer can probably accomplish most things that we would require. By the way, Naomasa is portrayed as both having a strong sense of justice and seems to be quite competent even if the story doesn't necessarily allow him to show that off just yet. He is staunchly against the idea of vigilantes though, but we'll see where that will lead us. Back with the main crew though, for the most part they're sort of settled into a routine. The three go around trying to figure out more concrete leads to the source of trigger. Knuckle Duster spars with Koichi a ton to train him up, while Quinn the B-Girl seems to still be going around giving away these trigger drugs to anyone with any kind of malicious intent. Now, as far as the plot goes, I do have one problem that I have trouble understanding the intent of the villains or villain. I get that villains should do villainous things, but the motivation as it stands seems really weak and I hope more layers are added in regards to our motivation because this is so far just some weak sauce. On the other hand, similar to Quinn's identity crisis, Koichi is struggling with his hero name as due to past run-ins latching on to the name The Hauler, everyone seems to be calling him The Hauler over his chosen name of The Crawler. With that said, I personally do think that the Hauler is a better name, especially as a superhero name, over the Crawler especially, but it's his call, you know? The villain of the week steps in to Knuckle Duster's delight as he finally gets to swing his fist, something he felt he hasn't been really able to recently. I think the biggest takeaway is that we find out Quinn isn't the head honcho as she does report to some kind of superior, and during that conversation we understand that she's more of a coordinator in this whole plan. Now one thing that is interesting about this spinoff is that even though it's technically a special, there are still special chapters which makes them either doubly special or they cancel out and makes it not special. Poor math jokes out of the way, the extra chapter wasn't overly consequential, but it does help give additional life to this world. Pretty much what happens is that the various heroes showed up to help out at the end of the last volume, they're sitting together to discuss this sudden surge and quote unquote criminal outbreak. While the contents of this meeting is rather boring, I think the exchanges between the various heroes present really help contextualize them and reinforces the identities of the various characters involved. There's another extra chapter featuring a meeting between Naomasa and Unboosted Na All Might 2. Right, so if you haven't seen MHA, I suppose I should explain. All Might is essentially this world Superman minus the powers of flight, cross breath, super intelligence, lasers, uh, anyway, he's a really strong dude. However, All Might's weakness is that he can't really hold on to his super form for extended periods of time and often reverts back to his rather feeble and weak form. As such, his quote unquote normal form is this stringy, unhealthy looking dude. Think as if. Think as if Clark Kent was an actual stick of a man who has the ability to turn into Superman every so often instead of just literally just taking off his glasses. Anyway, back to the extra, to me and Naomasa's detective skills, not that you really need any, he suddenly notices that the weak guy acting as All Might's agent is actually All Might himself. Nothing really comes out of this, to be honest. This really just builds this relationship that the two have as All Might entrusts his secret to Naomasa while also ex explaining what the day-to-day -day as a non-souped-up All Might might look like. Back to the real story though, we find ourselves in a situation where Koichi in a civilian outfit gets to meet a true hero in the form of Ingenium. Now Ingenium is a small time character in the mainline series, mainly serving as his figurehead for his younger brother who is a more prominent character. This is where Vigilante comes in and does what it does best, give limelight to these otherwise easily forgettable characters. Essentially, Ingenium spots Koichi using his quirk and notices that Koichi struggles with heart stops and turns. What Koichi has been doing most of the time when needing to stop or turns is that he views things 
things in sort of like levels. So to Koichi, there are three options of go, stop, and turn. What that really means is that he struggles with shifting from one to the other in a smooth fashion. Ingenium points out that instead of thinking of things as go and stop, he should instead think of things as go but from multiple angles. It's a, it's sort of a simple concept in review, but this kind of dynamic thinking goes to show how intelligent Ingenium is, especially when it comes to how to best utilize your own quirk. At the end of their little meeting, Ingenium even goes as far as offering Koichi a sort of internship under him. Overall, Ingenium is just such a likable guy on so many levels. Koichi puts his newfound discoveries to the test and even swoops in to aid Ingenium out while in vigilante mode. At the end of the day, Ingenium does realize that Koichi is the crawler and rescinds his offer, but I think this is more out of appreciation for what Koichi does than anything else. Honestly, this was one of my favorite chapters of Volume 2 because if you've only really read or watched the mainline series, it's hard to understand why Ingenium was alleged so well liked and beloved but here it sort of humanizes it and it solves that mystery moving on we had another bonus chapter which was meh at best we get introduced to a new character called enigma and the only real enigma of this chapter is why it exists all jokes aside we move on to a more laid-back chapter where the backstory of why koichi wears the all might costume why koichi didn't try to get into the hero high school and why pop step who we would later find out is called kazuho sticks around him and knuckle duster Essentially, Koichi is a big fan of All Might, there's not really much explanation there. However, when he was in middle school on the way to the Hero High School entrance exams that we saw in the early chapters of My Hero Academia, he saw a young boy drowning so he jumped in to rescue him, finally leaving the boy one of his many official All Might memorabilia outfits, but ending up missing the exam. He laments the fact that he couldn't even try to become a hero but also feels some kind of pride in having saved a young boy in exchange. This leads us to a potentially sweet ending of, end of it being revealed that Kazuho, so Pop Step, was the young boy for back then who was never really a young boy but that Koichi just really never checked as he was running late for exam. I don't know if I like this or not as of yet. It does set up future avenues for it too but I did find this a little ham-fisted. Overall I'm fine with it, it's a cute little thing to add. I don't particularly like Koichi's obsession with All Might but but I suppose that if we had a superman like being in our world, there'd be a ton of merch for him too. Well, the last few bits have been relatively tame, if not slice of life-ish. The last bit of Volume 2 turns it up a notch. While doing his diligence as a vigilante, Koichi gets chased down by Akira, who is this rocky looking dude that we met back in Volume 1. He's not really important, so don't worry if you've just heard of him. Now remember, Koichi is not the best one-on-one -on -one combatant, so he does easily get overpowered by this rock man. He gets saved by this mask-wearing samurai ninja called Stendhal? Standall? St Stendhal? who parries Akira's punches and saves Koichi. Akira runs and Stendhal chases after him, but not before having a quick exchange with Koichi saying that he respects him as a fellow vigilante. Koichi is sort of awestruck for most of the chapter, but while he gushes towards the other two of the trio, we personally see that Stendhal is literally hunting villains down and killing them, including Akira from earlier. To expand on that, we actually have an entire bonus chapter dedicated to Stendhal mercilessly killing off villains. Another thing that we learn is that Stendhal really sees his vigilante personality as somewhat of an Avenger type of figure. And I don't mean like Marvel's Avengers, but rather the actual definition of the word, as in he sees whoever wearing the mask to need to take the role of some kind of vengeful spirit or, or angel or something. While we can debate about the ethics of killing criminals and villains, one thing that's for sure is that Quinn seems to play a role in leading Stendhal in specific directions by providing data on potentially dangerous individuals. The kicker of all this is that we know that Quinn has some part to play in the trigger situation. All she's really doing is trying to have Stendhal clean up her tracks by having him kill all those she had a direct or indirect role in infecting. Meanwhile, Stendhal is a one mind track kind of guy, meaning he doesn't really ask questions. In his mind, he's more than happy to just simply just wipe evil off the streets, even if he may or may not know he's working with and for a villain. Another person coming back into the fold and one of the people whose data was provided is the first baddie that Koichi had to face, which is Spike Boy or Soga. We soon find that much like I explained earlier, Quinn seems to be playing both sides, always trying to push people to use Trigger while also leading Stendhal on to culling those who use the drug. This time, Quinn is essentially heating the tension between Soga and Stendhal who meets and offers Trigger to Soga. Soga refuses, even going as far as to shatter some of the vials, but Quinn uses her B powers to inject him with the drug anyway, turning him into the Hedgehog Shark that we saw in Volume 1. Monster Soga and Stendhal end up fighting and it becomes clear that Stendhal, who was designed to pretty much kill, is getting the edge on him, but in pops Koichi who, while respecting Stendhal as a vigilante, does not vibe with his MO and tries to escape with Soga on his back. Because Soga in monster mode is at least like 3 or 4 times his usual weight, Koichi struggles to get away and eventually gets slashed by Stendhal. 
While he does almost potentially escape, Stendhal reveals that he personally has a quirk enabling him to lick the blood of anybody, which would end up temporarily paralyzing them. Now, first off, is this medically safe? Ignoring how nasty it sounds just from a culinary point of view, what if that person had like AIDS or something? No way that is a good idea. I honestly think this is one of those powers that wouldn't really fly in the mainline series, who tends to lean more towards the shonen or teen demographic. But anyway, let's let's just move on. Stendhal is right about to end the lives of both of our runners, but in comes Knuckle Duster. Knuckle Duster and Stendhal share some dialogue, mainly stuff about how their philosophies differ and how because they differ, they really just can't see eye to eye. Man, this fight is super funny because for a bit, the art like jumped a level and Stendhal was rushing towards Knuckle Duster in a way that almost seems One Punch Man-esque, but Knuckle Duster legit just swings his fist at Stendhal's face, giving him a good whack and shattering his mask. A little more goes on, but Stendhal really just can't understand why he's losing, but then he realizes it, and it's, it's not the right reason by the way, he just up and runs. While it's a quiet night for a main crew, we cut to Stendhal who made his way to this abandoned bathroom kind of place and it turns out that his revelation was that he was hiding behind the mask and that he should commit to becoming the character. So he literally just cuts off his face, Joker style from, from DC Comics. It shows us that this dude is, uh, is unhinged, yeah. And Quinn being there really just doesn't help. So anyway guys, that brings us to the end of Volume 2. I hope you liked it and wow, this standout guy is... Uh, is screwed up in the noggin. I personally don't really like Quinn right now, not necessarily because it's of her being a villain, but more because I have yet to really understand her real motivations. On the other hand, the highlight of the volume was definitely in Genium because in the mainline series, he was always praised, but there was never really context as to why he was so praiseworthy. It was really hard to latch onto him from there. This volume really showed us how cool his powers are, how efficient he is with them, how smart he is, and overall just how likable he is. This added dimensions to an otherwise throwaway character and again, I have to repeat, this is the best characteristics about this spin-off series if you're a fan of My Hero Academia. Overall solid volume, a little too much bonus content as weird as that sounds, but it all adds up to a better overall package. I still want to know a little more about Trigger. I think Stendhal is an interesting character, but I also feel like I've learned everything I want to about him, so I hope the writer can bring him into more interesting places. We still haven't learned much about Knuckle Duster, but we have learned a little more about Pop Step, so that's nice. I don't know. What we have so far still feels sort of introductory, as it should be of course, but I'm excited to see where we go from here. And that brings us to an end to the second part of My Hero Academia Vigilantes. Hope you enjoyed this rundown. If you are, leave the usual suite of that YouTubers recommend, whether it be a comment, a like, a subscribe, or any combination of the three. But that's all from me. You wanna... Hector. So he literally just cuts off his face, Joker style, from, from DC Comics. It shows us that this dude is, uh, is unhinged. Yeah. And Quinn being there really just doesn't help. So anyway guys, that brings us to the end of Volume 2. I hope you liked it, and wow, this Stendhal guy is, uh, is screwed up in the noggin. I personally don't really like Quinn right now, not necessarily because it's of her being a villain, but more because I have yet to really understand her real motivations. On the other hand, the highlight of the volume was definitely in Genium because in the mainline series, he was always praised, but there was never really context as to why he was so praiseworthy. It was really hard to latch onto him from there. This volume really showed us how cool his powers are, how efficient he is with them, how smart he is, and overall just how likable he is. This added dimensions to an otherwise throwaway character, and again, I have to repeat, this is the best characteristics about this spin-off series if you're a fan of My Hero Academia. Overall solid volume, a little too much bonus content as weird as that sounds, but it all adds up to a better overall package. I still want to know a little more about Trigger. I think Stendhal is an interesting character, but I also feel like I've learned everything I want to about him, so I hope the writer can bring him into more interesting places. We still haven't learned much about Knuckle Duster, but we have learned a little more about Pop Step, so that's nice. I don't know. What we have so far still feels sort of introductory, as it should be of course, but I'm excited to see where we go from here. And that brings us to an end to the second part of My Hero Academia Vigilantes. Hope you enjoyed this rundown. If you are, leave the usual suite of that YouTubers recommend, whether it be a comment, a like, a subscribe, or any combination of the three. But that's all from me. You wanna...